You're good on this, right, Phil? You're all set? Second session here, I appreciate it. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, Phil O'Brien. Phil um, was a college football player at the University of Maine, uh, coached at the University of Maine as well. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Maine, got his master's also at the University of Maine, and then uh, a graduate of the Harvard Business School executive program, uh, and spent uh, 34 years in his career uh, as an international business executive, and he's going to talk uh, about something that I think uh, is business related and pertains to uh, the basketball world, uh, change management. He's now uh, the CEO of the York Consulting Group, so uh, Phil O'Brien. No, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob, for that very, very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here today. Can everybody hear me, first off? Okay, good. No, it's great to be here uh, to talk to you about change management, a subject that is near and dear to me. At a session like this, it almost seems like change management may seem to be an, an unusual uh, segment to have. However, there are two important fundamental career goals that you all have as coaches, and I believe change management speaks directly to each. Your desire for career longevity and program success. Effective change management can help deliver each. And what we're gonna do in our time together this afternoon is show you how. In terms of the plan, we're gonna look first at what Webster's Dictionary has to say about some very basic terms, just so that we're, we know we're speaking the same language and that we're on the same page. Uh, we'll look very quickly at some change basics. From there, obstacles and barriers. What gets in the way of change? What can derail a change effort? And I purposely have put obstacles and barriers ahead of the next bullet, how do you make change happen? Because if you don't deal with the obstacles and barriers, your change never does happen. In terms of the change, if it takes place, it's a process, it's not a one-off event. We'll look at the role of hearts and minds in terms of embedding and sustaining the change. And then we'll wrap up with some pearls of wisdom for your future consideration. What I'm hoping is that from this, you'll see that if you embrace change management, it can make you a better coach. And if you're a better coach, your desire for career longevity and program success are fulfilled. Now, in terms of the content of my session, it comes from two basic sources. Uh, one, the lessons of my own experience. As Bob said, I was an international business executive. I spent seven years based in London, where I was responsible for client development from Dublin to Istanbul, Turkey, and from Helsinki to Johannesburg. And one of my charges was to establish a common approach to client development that would span that territory. And that involved change. So I've walked the change walk, and I've learned the lessons from my own experience. Second sourcing is I've had great coaches myself. Uh, one of my coaches was at Harvard Business School, uh, John Carter, who is the LeBron James of change management. So what you're gonna get is, you know, kind of a potpourri of my own experience with some academic credibility, and I hope that, you know, you can kind of take it all in, adapt it to your own purposes, and put it to work. In terms of Webster's, you can read the slide. These are not Phil O'Brien definitions for my purposes. I just Googled coaching and I came up with the top bullet. And I Googled change management and I came up with the second bullet. Coaching, operative terms, training, directing, teaching, instruction, preparation. I don't think we need to beat this to death. I think we can all pretty much agree that what you do as coaches is something around along those lines. Change management is probably a topic, a, a concept that you're less familiar with, 
But what I would point out, a structured approach, it's not random. It's very much intentional. A structured approach to transitioning individuals, teams, from a current state to a future state. You're here, we want to get to there. Now, if you think about the two definitions, if you're coaching, you're taking an individual player or a team from where they are now to where you want them to be or where you think they need to be in order to be successful. If you look at change management, if you're transitioning people from here to there, inherent in that process is the need for training, directing, instruction. Thus, my bullet point at the, the bottom, coaching is change management. <coughs> Whether you knew it before, as coaches, you are in the change management business. And I believe if you embrace change, man change management principles and adapt them to your own environments, it's going to make you a better coach. But very much change management, <coughs> coaching are synonymous terms. In terms of basics, the challenge of what, why, and how, I'm going to break that into two components. The what, why, how is what are you going to change, why are you going to change it, and how are you going to implement it. The point here is those three thoughts are not mutually exclusive. They are not mutually exclusive. If you get the, the what and the why, you know what you're changing and you know why you're changing it, but you blow the how, no change takes place. Implementation is key. Likewise, you can conclude that something needs to change, i.e., you've got the why, you've got the rationale. We have to change our defensive philosophy. And you get down exactly how you're going to go about changing that defensive philosophy, but you pick the wrong what, you basically successfully change to something that is perhaps not better than what you started out with. Or you get a partial win. So getting the what, why, how right is key. Now the challenge comes if you just think about the environment that we now live in. Incredible complexity. A smorgasbord of information operating at warp speed. And kind of a cultural milieu that's uh, it's all about kind of sound bites and instant gratification. So here you are trying to figure out what, why, how in a crazy environment. My thesis is, if you take the right approach to change, you can successfully navigate what makes it challenging. Second two bullets align with one another. Change talk versus change do is simple human nature. Most people don't want to change. If we sit there and we kind of take a, take a read on how much we talk about change versus how much we actually change, it's like this. I mean, it, by case in point, I would suggest to you something as simple as New Year's resolutions. Most, most of them don't survive the February, much less the second week of January. And that links to the fact that with change, there's no magic pills. What I like to say is that life would be great if we could get fit without exercise and lose weight without diet. And you're chuckling, which is what I was hoping you were going to do, because you're absolutely right. You've got to put in the work. And the same thing is true of change. If you put in the work, you can get the change. But don't think it's going to be easy, and don't think it's going to be a quick fix. In terms of obstacles and barriers, I'm, like I said at the outset, I'm putting this up front. You typically, in a seminar like this, you're here to talk about change, so I kind of outline the change process. And then I tell you about the obstacles and barriers. And the key thing with change is that there are obstacles and barriers. They are out there. They are real. They cannot be avoided. And if you don't address them up front, they're going to derail your change effort before you ever get started. Now, what I'd like you to do, this is the audience participation component of the uh, program, just take a quick sec and just look around at who's sitting next to you, who's sitting in front of you, who's sitting behind you. 
We need, I need to see heads moving. <laughs> All right, and just file that away. Just file it. You did that very, very well. Thank you for that. Now, what we're dealing with here is a small number that represents the biggest issue as it relates to change. 0.0001%. For those of you keeping score, that is one ten thousandth of a percent, which is a really, really small number. Now, at the moment of your conception, your life's conception, not birth, conception, you received a genetic code that made you, you. Gender, cognitive abilities, hair color, everything that makes you, you was inscribed in that genetic code. Your genetic code is unique to you, but the difference between your genetic code and anybody else is one ten thousandth of a percent. Now ponder that and think about who you just looked at, which may be a very disturbing reality. <laughs> what does this have to do with change? I submit it has everything to do with change. The biggest pushback to change is the reality that I or we don't need to change because I or we are different. And I just gave you evidence to subject to, uh, to, to support the, thought, the notion that while you are unique, we are all fundamentally the same. Now, I know this is gimmicky, and you guys are smiling, which is what I was hoping you were going to do. I know it's gimmicky, but I've used this, and it worked. When I was in Europe, and I'm in Germany, and I'm trying to in, you know, change things, I've got Dieter telling me that Wolfgang is very different from him, and therefore, I don't need to change. I've heard it in 40 countries. When the role expanded further, and now I'm talking about how France and Germany need to work together to achieve goals, you factor in a thousand years of history, and you get not only are we different, we're better than them, and we don't like them either. What I'm saying is you've got to get, I'm different, therefore I don't need to change off the table, or you're never going to progress. And this slide, with the simple narrative I just shared with you, is a way to do it. I've done it in 40 countries, and it works. People smile, they think, and then their minds open. All I want, give me, give me a, a sliver of an open mind, that's all I need to get in there and then I'll start changing. So that's an obstacle. Too fast, too slow, just right? Okay. And as with Bob, if anything I say you know, strikes a chord, you want to ask a question, make a comment, feel free. Another obstacle and barrier, competing influences. Some of them are imposed upon us, think NCAA regulations, some of them we impose on ourselves and on others. They're there, they cannot be avoided. My advice here is to recognize them, acknowledge them, respect them, but try to work towards striking a balance that works for you in your environment. Now there are three. First one, academic perfection versus real world applicability. In business, people are always coming up with a revised process. And you get people that typically are never going to have to employ the process, are the ones devising the process, and they come up with the perfect process that is wonderful. I can't critique it, but it fails the real world applicability test. When we try to implement it in an office with people that have got too much to do and not enough time to do it, it fails. So you've got to strike a balance between having it be perfect versus what's going to work in the real world. As a former football coach, football coaches are notorious for this. They come up with the perfect scheme, which when you go live with a defense, it doesn't work. We had a game plan one time that involved four reads. And in practice, by Thursday, there was an intervention amongst the defensive backs just saying, look, we get to the right place, but we're 10 yards behind the ball carrier. We've got to simplify this. 
Again, striking a balance between academic perfection versus real world applicability. Structure versus flexibility. Too much structure, you turn people into robots. And they don't like it. Too much flexibility, and you get multiple ways of doing the same thing, which is confusion. Think straight line drives, for example. How are you defining it, and how are you implementing it to defend it? If you've got multiple ways of doing the same thing, all you're doing is breeding confusion. And when you breed confusion in your players, they lose confidence in you. So again, find a balance between structure and flexibility. When you go to structure, you're giving up flexibility. When you go to flexibility, you're giving up structure. Find a balance. Lastly, team consistency versus individual autonomy. This affects a, a, you know, a myriad of issues, but you're trying to come up with a way your team is going to play, a way your team is going to be managed and led. But you've got to balance that with the individual. What works for the players on your team? They all have strengths and weaknesses. They all have assets and liabilities, but you've got to strike a balance. When I was in Europe, trying to implement a European-wide client development process, if I suggest to the Belgians that they have to do something that doesn't work in Belgium, they're not going to do it. Not because they're insubordinate, but they just simply can't do what doesn't work where they are. So it's about striking a balance. Now the whole point here is you're never going to know when you get the balance right. So my point is don't get hung up on that. But if you recognize the fact that an obstacle and barrier to change are competing influences, and here they are, and if you're thinking, if you're thinking, okay, academic, is it too academic and not real world? Is it too much struck? If you're thinking about that stuff, you're going to find yourself in the right place. If you don't think about that stuff, you're never going to know. Questions? Comments? We're good? All right, get into it. Making change happen, setting the stage. As I said, it's a process. It's not a one-off event. And setting the stage is key. You first have to do your homework, which involves quantitative and qualitative analysis, which sounds really academic, but it doesn't really have to be. By quantitative, I'm talking about the story of the numbers. When I would go into a country, they're saying, look, sales function's a train wreck. We need somebody to figure it out. Okay, I would look at a bunch of different metrics, the same way that you would look at metrics, and I believe every set of numbers tells a story, so what's the story that this set of numbers is telling me? Win rate, performance versus plan, ratio of pipeline to outstanding target, you, assist to turnover ratio, offensive field goal percentage, how many times you're getting to the foul line, you've got the stats, what's the story of the numbers? Figure it out. Now, where most people, I think, miss an opportunity, it's not a question of being wrong, I purposely said miss an opportunity, is they stop there. To me, you balance the quantitative with the qualitative. It's what do people tell you if you ask them the right questions? And it's what it is that you can learn if you listen fully and completely to what they have to say. And if you then make sense out of that, and you will, what my experience has been, and I think the same would be true for you, is the stories from people are going to provide color and depth and feeling to what the story of the numbers are. When I went to the UK, the sales function was a train wreck. And I asked 80 people the same 10 questions, and I just listened to what they told me. Now, I've got to be honest, I hated some of what they were telling me. But it wasn't about how I felt about things, it's just I needed to understand. And I made sense out of it. What the, the result of it, it gave me clarity, it gave me focus, it reduced the confusion, it gave me confidence, and then we rolled it out. And we went on a run of 60 straight months on or ahead of plan that had never been done before. And when I was rolling out change, which is involving people having to do things different, I was able to couch it with, when you were free to tell me anything, this is what you said. And people go, oh yeah, I can remember telling him that. So it gives credibility to what it is you're trying to change. So do your homework. Create urgency. People aren't going to change unless there's a reason to change. Now, when I was studying under 
Cotter, the LeBron James of change management, my light bulb moment, bang, the light went on, was this, this is Cotter, this isn't Phil O'Brien talking, is the key to urgency is increasing the dissatisfaction level. I was, you know, I heard that, it was like, wow, you know, because what are you told as a coach, what are you told as a, as a business leader, you know, you're, you're supposed to build morale up, you're not supposed to send it down. Now, there's a right way to do this that will get that result, but you have got to increase the dissatisfaction level. And by the dissatisfaction level, what I mean is people have to reach the conclusion that where they are isn't good enough. Where they are is not sustainable. Where they are is untenable. Whether you're trying to survive or whether you're trying to succeed, I don't care what the motivation is. You've got to increase the dissatisfaction level. And with the dissatisfaction level, now you've got their attention and they're open to it. Okay, if this is really <clears throat> is bad and here's the evidence to support, okay, I got it. This isn't good. Now, again, the mind opens and they're receptive to whatever change it is you might be suggesting. Next step in setting the stage is identifying and picking the team. Now, as a coach, you can't do this by yourself. You can't. You try to do it by yourself, you're going to fail. You need a team. It could be your staff, support staff. I would even submit it, in, it should include your players. Now, in terms of the team, they fall into several categories. Leaders, you all have an intuitive sense of what a leader is. Influencers. Influencers can be positive and they can be negative. Think influencers when the best player, when the leader of your team speaks and the rest of the team is, is listening to that person, who do they turn to second for a reaction? That's an influencer. They're going, oh, Bob is saying this, what does Ralph think? It's the second person they turn to. If you're the head coach, most players have a favorite assistant, typically the assistant that recruited them. Head coach is saying something. They're turning to the, what's my assistant go? And if the assistant is staring at the ceiling, checking the Blackberry, not there, you're eroding the message of the head coach, vice versa. The head coach says, assistant, run this, and the head coach leaves the gym, you just influenced the team to maybe take this less seriously than if you were there dialed in and supported. That's what an influencer is. Followers, there's a people like, you make sense, I'm with you. And obstructors, these are your contrarians. They're just against everything. Now what you're gonna find is that depending upon the issue, these roles can change. There can be an issue where somebody's a leader, another one where they're an influencer, another one where they're a follower. If I'm in a meeting and we're talking about the summer vacation schedule, given the amount of stuff that was on my plate, I really don't care. Make a decision, tell me what it is, and let's move on to something else. I'm a follower on that. Something else, if it's sales strategy, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a collaborative partner, but I'm gonna be in a leadership position on that part. So these will vary, but you gotta know who they are. And the key thing here is avoid the Kool-Aid. And I got this thing called 1080-10. The 1080-10 is something I've come up with, and it's arbitrary, but it, it makes my point. This 10%, are the people that are bought in. If you say jump, they say how high and when do you want me to come down? The other 10 are these obstructors. They're contrarians. No matter what it is, if you say it's left, they say it's right. If you say it's up, they say it's down. Now this may be less of an issue when you're coaching, but certainly in the business world that this exists. And you've got this big group in the middle that's got an open mind and they're just looking for somebody to point me in the right direction. The mistake leaders make is they either get drunk in their own Kool-Aid and they spend all their time talking to this 10% getting an inflated sense of how much they're loved or they get, because they're narcissistic in some cases, they just can't believe that there's people that don't love me and they spend a whole lot of time trying to convert the unconvertible. And what happens is this bunch in the middle are ignored. So get a sense of who's who, that's my point. Appreciate this, we all love to be loved, appreciate this, but don't ascribe the feelings here that everybody feels that way, and focus on the 80 in the middle, because if you can make sense, 
they're going to follow where you're asking them to go. Clear? Again, too fast, too slow, just right? Okay, making change happen, deciding what, why, and how. If you've set the stage, that challenge of what, why, and how that I talked about early on, you've met the challenge. If you've done your homework and you've picked the team, you know what, you know why, and you know how. Now the whole point here is you want to paint a picture of the change you seek, which gets into vision. So dependent upon the change you're talking about, it's got breadth, it's got depth, it's got detail, it's got schemes, it's stat, whatever it is. What you want to try to do is tie it together with a vision. A vision encapsulates the detail. A vision simplifies. A vision motivates. Think of vision as change glue. Vision as change glue. And differentiate vision from decree. A vision is positive. A decree is negative. A vision is about us. A decree is about you. A vision is about if we do. A vision, a decree, excuse me, is if you don't. Now, the reality of visions and decrees is that decrees are easy. You send an email, you post a note in the locker room, you know, you make a big pronouncement at a team meeting and you walk away and you're done. Visions are hard work. But it's changed glue. Now, if I say, particularly to this audience, if I say the word havoc, what comes to mind? <laughs> I'm hearing Shaka. Shaka Smart VCU. Yeah, Shaka Smart VCU. One word. Okay, when you, when, okay, stay with that. Okay, havoc, what is it? Mindset. So, where, how they act. Yep. They're getting after the, their play defensively. Mindset, getting after it, well, that's, that's visual. What else you got? Stressful. Stressful, feeling. Lock away feeling, like, so just with one word. That, I've done a little bit of reading on, on this. Havoc started with, with Shaka wanting a vision statement. Now he might not have said, I need to have a vision statement for the teachings of Harvard Business School, but he wanted a vision that would capture how he wanted his team to play defense. Now, it's since become a brand. And that's what you call a home run vision. So again, the power of vision. Here you are, I say havoc, boom, you've got it. You not only you have, does it, do you get the association with VCU, you get, a hand, you get a handle on what it is, and you get a handle on how it makes people feel. Powerful, powerful. The hard work of making change happen, communication. Understanding of buy-in is the whole why behind the change. And the key with, with communication is the importance of varying the audience. And by varying the audience, you talk to the team, you talk to the bigs, you talk to the backcourt, you talk one-on-one. -on -one. Vary it in terms of the audiences within which you're communicating your vision of change. Second thing, vary the medium. Numbers, words, pictures, stories, metaphors, vary the medium so they're not getting hit with the same thing over and over again. The message is the same, it's coming at them from different angles. And one of the key things here is how much communication is enough. Carter suggests in the business world that business leaders consistently under communicate by a factor of 10, which is gigantic. When I was involved with this change I was, that was taking place, again, Dublin to Istanbul, Helsinki to Johannesburg, I got to the point where I, it was exhausting and I was sick to death of listening to myself. And I, I asked Carr, I said, I said, look, here's the deal. I, I'm, I'm making myself crazy. And he asked me two questions. Are you varying the audience? Yes. Are you varying the medium? Yes. His response was, if you're approaching the point, this is a benchmark for you, if you're approaching the point where you really can't stand listening to yourself anymore, you're just starting to approach probably communicating the minimal acceptable amount. That's how much communication is involved. 
to give you a handle. You can't under-communicate it. Empowerment, inside out. Inside out, think a pond. Think a rock. The rock gets tossed into the pond. It hits with a splash and the water ripples out. That's inside out. The rock is you and your change team. That's what I mean by inside out. I have seen business leaders basically try to change something as a referee. It's like the game's going on over here and they're going, okay, oh, there's, a, you know, there's a foul on you, there's a foul. No, you're not gonna change anything. You gotta get in the game. So empowerment, inside out, you and your team. Eliminate barriers and excuses. Remember early on that I said that people don't wanna change. They just don't. They're, not, they're willing to change if they have a reason, but they're not gonna change for the fun of it. So they're gonna be looking for barriers and excuses. And you need to be identifying what's getting in the way. Carter suggests that there's two kinds of barriers, that there's structural and there's people. Structural can be literally physical. You wanna have an off-season weight training program, but the weight room is not open in a manner that's consistent with when your players are available. You gotta fix that. Organizational, the org chart, who reports to whom. And the wild card, all this is people. Some people obstruct change just because they don't know any better. Other people obstruct change because they've got devious <coughs> mindsets and personal agendas and they're threatened by your success. The catch is it's there. It ain't going away and you have to confront it. Now, when I was you know, making my changes all across Europe, I confronted these things and one of the examples of my get out of jail card on a conversation like that, I would hear some completely illogical reason why we couldn't do something and I would sit there and patiently listen to it and then I would go, this is all very, very interesting. Now again, I'm in Europe, I'm not in America. I say, as a planet, we've successfully taken a person and flown them to the moon and brought them back safely. If as a planet, we can go to the moon and back, surely we can find a way to deal with what I was considering nonsense. The point is, if you care about the change, you've gotta be willing to fight for it. And when you're confronted with illogic, don't walk away. Because if you're changing, you've kinda of concluded, go back to the title page, you've concluded, if we need to change in order for us to be successful and for me to have career longevity. That's a good reason to change. Seek and celebrate short-term wins quickly. I don't think this is really an issue with coaches, but as it relates to change, every time they do something right, celebrate it, because all that does is serve to reinforce the change. Critically important, find them and celebrate them. And relentless push, Sir Isaac Newton had a law, the law of reciprocal action, which says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, as coaches, you know, we may be lords of our domain, but we are not immune to the laws of nature. So a reality that you're gonna face as you're changing things, you're moving things around, you're, you're pushing boundaries, you're redefining boundaries, there's gonna be pushed back. Don't take it personal. Accept it as a reality that's there and be prepared, be prepared to keep the pressure on. If you take your foot off the change accelerator, you're immediately slowing down. If you're not on offense, you're on defense. Change happens, new replaces old, key, embed the change. There, again, linked to the preceding slide, you know, what you wanna do is minimize and hopefully avoid regression. And as you're doing the change, what is often a good strategy is to find a way to take your change and graft it onto something that's already in place, that isn't broken, that is working. Grafting new onto old is a good thing, not a bad thing. Now the new reality that ensues from the change is the new culture. The point here being is the change you, in, you impact precedes the cultural effect that it has. The cultural effect is the result. I've seen, again, in the business world, they talk about, oh, we're gonna change the culture as the starting point. That's a change effort that's DOA. You change something, that impacts the culture. The change precedes the culture, the culture follows the change. 
which then leads to the challenge of sustaining, which gets into the role of hearts and minds. Now, this is, you could, Bob and I were talking, we could do an hour just on this stuff. I mean, this is just a rich treasure trove of information. But the role of hearts and minds, I think, has two purposes for us here today. You know, one, it's, it addresses the whole need to sustain the change, because if you don't sustain the change, Sir Isaac Newton suggests the pendulum's gonna swing back and it's gonna become undone. The second thing is I think it impacts those of you who recruit. Now, what we got here is thinking versus feeling, Aristotle and physical and emotional experiences. These are basically three different takes off the same general topic matter. And I'm just giving you three ways of looking at it. The thesis being that left to our own devices, we typically are two mind thinking, logos, physical centered. There's nothing wrong with that because you need both. But typically left to our own devices, we have a tendency to skew mind thinking, logos, physical. And in so doing, we don't fully take advantage of the power and potential of the heart, feeling, ethos, and pathos, and emotional. There's a huge upside if you harness both. Now, thinking versus feeling, that's classic caught. Thinking, you know, uh, logic, data, drives decision making. Feeling, visual, pictures, stories, analogies that provoke an emotional response. Carter suggests that change is about changing, ultimately, behavior. At the end of the day, you're trying to change behavior. And thinking differently can change behavior. Feeling differently changes behavior more. And that's based upon research that suggests that analysis of data, while it can alter people's thinking, has less of an impact than experiences that provoke emotions and the changes in feelings that those have. So it's about feeling. You think, you know, havoc. There's a thinking component to that. There's a feeling component. I heard the word stress. That's about feeling. Aristotle, ethos, pathos, logos, ethos. We're going to change the defensive philosophy. Okay, this becomes an example of ethos when we say we're going to change the defensive philosophy to align ourselves with what Coach Bob Walsh is doing at Rick, who's been to seven straight NCAA tournaments, citing a credible source as a, as a part of your persuasion is what ethos is all about. And it's, it's powerfully important. Citing John Wooden, bunches of examples. Pathos, emotion. Chris Christie just did lap band you know, surgery. And they asked him, like, why'd you do it? And it was interesting. His answer was, I realized that I probably wasn't gonna live to see my kids grow up, and I have two daughters, and I'm probably not gonna be able to walk them down the aisle. Now, I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna go political on you, I don't know Chris Christie, obviously, but you know, suffice it to say that he's had the body mass index and been told, well, you're here and you need to be over here. He's been told what his cholesterol level, uh, all appeals to thinking. <coughs> Somebody got to him and it was like, you wanna walk your daughter down the aisle someday? Boom, now he's doing something about it. Again, the power of feelings. Last of physical experience versus emotional experience. This is, this is great stuff. What these two combine to do is create what in business circles they, they call the customer experience. Now, the customer experience, and I'm gonna read a definition to you, is the interaction of an organization and a customer involving physical performance. What? What is happening? And the senses stimulated versus expectations. That's a customer experience. Now, if you think about that definition, and I'm happy to read it again if people want me to, and you substitute coaching experience, playing experience, fan experience, game day experience, 
the coaching experience, the playing experience is the interaction of a coach with a player involving physical performance and the senses stimulated versus expectations. It's the same. It's all the same. So the customer experience is a function of physical and emotional. Now, by physical, physical is products, services, price, location, what league you're in, the gym, schedule. Those are all physical examples of physical elements. Emotional, trust, love, gratification, recognition, belongingness. These are all feelings. And it's about how the what impacts the how you feel about it. My way of teaching this, thus the picture of a steak, is if I were to say to you, how do you like your steak? And you're going to describe, you know, I like it seasoned and marinated this way. I like it grilled. And I like it grilled <coughs> ideally medium rare. That, that description is the physical. Now, if I then take you one step further and I say, if you get that steak, prepared and cooked exactly the way you like it. How does it make you feel? Makes me feel content. Makes me feel proud. I can afford to do this. I feel good about myself. I feel like I'm rewarding myself. Whatever it is, how it makes you feel is the key. The point being that and a, a, a customer experience, a playing experience, a coaching experience is about how it makes you feel. It's not necessarily limited to exactly what it is. So when you think about recruiting, for example, and, you, and if you're appealing to feelings, you're embedding your change. If you get into, into recruiting and you end up finding out what's important to a player, and they say, well, proximity, you know, the idea that it's not that far from where I live. Okay, why is that important to you? Well. My mom and dad can go to the games. Then you go, when your mom and dad are at the games, how does it make you feel? Ask the questions. How does it make you feel? I feel proud. I feel loved. I feel accepted. Now, depending upon the kid, you know, and these are young people, they're not necessarily going to open up and, 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 and unload the vault. But there's a reason behind what they say. In business, it's about how do you like this service? How do you feel when you get it the way you like it? Now, this seemed to have struck a chord earlier on. Bob took it from, and Bob, you know, jump in and again, questions from the group. Uh, Bob took it from the perspective of, of you know, values and culture. Um, I think this also has an impact on change. Because if you look at, I don't know if you people, it's the same quadrant that, uh, that Bob had up earlier. We've got four high performer, low values, high performer, high values, low performer, low, low performer, high. Your, your culture killers are here, high performer, low values. Your change killers are here, high performer, low values. Again, this comes from Jack Welch, who was really looking at, at okay, I got varying degrees of performance. You know, obviously my high performers perform best. He dug further. This is just his own genetic program. He dug further and he found that there were differences between the high performers that seem to share General Electric's values versus the high performers that didn't. He said, we, okay, there's something here we need to learn more. And they spent a lot of time really trying to dig into getting a handle on, okay, what's the value? The idea being that there is a difference between the two. Now the real challenge that comes here is what are your values? And if you don't know what your values are, then you're just completely, what you're basically saying is the left side of this chart doesn't exist. You in effect are taking the high performers and you're lumping them all together. The ones with high values and low, they're all in one group, these are my performers. And you're doing the same thing with low. And you're not getting differentiation and these people are in and they are corrosive to your culture. What also it happens is, trust me on this, the people over here know who these people are. And when they see them getting a pass, they resent it. Now they may not have an open rebellion,
but they're just sitting there, and when you're talking about, oh yeah, we're a team, you know, all that stuff that we say, and they're going, yeah, 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 but what about these guys? Your credibility is damaged as a result of that. So the whole thing is, is what are your values? Do you know what they are, and how do you measure them? Now my own, this is Phil O'Brien talking, my own thesis is I believe it's possible to have a quantitative measurement of qualitative behaviors. When I was in Europe, we, were, you know, we, we built our sales structure around helping clients and prospective clients solve their risk-related problem. I won't bore you with that further than what I just said. There was a methodology under which we would get a very quick, detailed handle on the business reality of a company and the, the issues they were contending with beyond the norm. It involved a little bit of extra work, but I streamlined it so it was easy to do. Our value was around really talking to people intelligently about their business and how we can help them. So I was able to measure, are you doing the methodology? What's the output of the methodology? Is the output getting into the pipeline? Are we working on the opportunities and are we, are we selling um, additional products and services to these clients and prospects? A quantitative measurement of a qualitative behavior. Same thing can be true here. You say, Defense, hustle, okay. What's hustle look like? Steals, deflections, denials. I'm just making this stuff up as I'm talking to you. Film will tell you that. You measure it. What you're measuring is what your players are gonna care about. And if those represent your values, and you're measuring, and you're rewarding, and recognizing that, suddenly that causes those values to be embraced. And I do think, because we got some questions, you know, the, you know, when I look at these four, these are your culture and change killers here, you know, the issue with them, and I, I heard it alluded to some of the questions, is, you know, these, these people, they're high maintenance and they're a time churn. I would typically in business audiences say, what's the most important commodity in, commodity in business? And I would get money, relationships, information, alternatives, all of which are important. And I go, but it's not the most important. The most important issue in business, and I think this is true for you, is time. Because if I've got time, I can get money. If I have time, I can get information. If I have time, I can get relationships. If I have time, I can come up with alternatives. But once I blow time, it's gone forever. And these people churn time. The time you spend babysitting these people is time you're not spending nurturing these folks so they know that they're truly appreciated and valued. And these people down here, these people here, low, low, those are what we call a recruiting mistake. What were we thinking when we got that person? Okay, you know, it could be a mistake for a bunch of different reasons which we won't belabor here. That's something over beers. Okay, these are your recruiting mistakes. These people here, low performer, these are, these are your coaching projects. This is the kid who loves being part of your program. This is the kid that's coming to practice jacked. This is the kid that's gonna push the starters and make them better. This is the kid that's gonna be giving you a solid 18 minutes when he's a junior and he may start as a senior. But if you lump this kid over here, he's eventually gonna transfer because you don't care about him. And if you give that kid some stuff they can do, that demonstrates their value, man, you are turning them loose. So it's important. I do believe you can, you can quantify and measure values, but you gotta, you gotta take some time to learn what your values are. Comments, questions on that? I know this was striking chords earlier. Yeah, please. Uh, I really agree with your high values, low values. Uh, you know, Coach said something before about uh, guys who walk with the truth. You know, like, uh, there's a, the old saying, uh, Zebras want to hang with zebras, the lions want to hang with lions, you know, sort of thing. So, I definitely the separation of most players, uh, what they know, you know, the other guys in the locker room. Um, but going back to your 10, 80, 10, yep. how would you get to that 80? Uh, and at least from what I've heard or experienced, wouldn't you want to focus on that 10 that had that high values in order to bring that 80? That's one of that's one of the strategies you would do. Yes. Yeah, you would you would be like focusing on the 10 to get to the 80, but you're focusing on them in a manner that draws the 80 in, as opposed to I, these are my teacher's pets, and you guys are just problems. 
or yeah, you're just kind of there, you're elevator music. So as a, basically as an indirect way of getting to the Correct. baby instead of saying, you know, you don't want to ignore both ends of the screen, yep. but you want to focus on the baby to bring them you know, closer to your values, exactly. your culture. So indirectly by, uh, you know, getting to them, you're going through the tent. Exactly. And, and it goes back to what I said, I, I think it was on the communication. I talked very the audience, very the medium. So I, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm going to press every button that I can press to try to get somebody where they need to be. I quit on people really slow, which doesn't mean that I'm violating Jack Welch's tenets. Because even for business, cutting somebody loose, that's organizational failure. And typically that costs several hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> And most companies don't really want to play games with several hundred thousand dollars. So the catch is, it's like you want to hire smart, and then like I, I, I will try everything I can to get through to somebody, to get them to where I want them to be. Then you reach a point where, okay, it's fish or cut bait. You do have to reach, you do have, you do reach that point. Good question. Others? Yeah. In the short term, very tough thing to um, say to those in the high high region of here, not ask them not to defend, or at least see them defend those high performers, low values. They see wins in a kid who, you know, he works 75% of the time, um, but he's a good player. So, you know, you bring that sort of stuff up to practice and you kind of not, not even, not calling kids out, but a lot of times, you, I feel like I've seen those guys in the high, high level, they, they want you to back off that shit. They want you to, they, want, they enjoy the culture, but they don't, they don't want you to kick him off the team for sure. No. And how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you not single that kid out and still teach him the values that you're looking for? A lot of times my, you know, because we, we have prima donnas in business and, and a lot of what makes these prima donnas tick is the public perception of them. So would I call these people out? Absolutely. Because I'm not going to have my, my leadership eroded, but I do it one-on-one. -on -one. There's things you can do one-on-one -on -one with the door shut. I'm not talking about anything inappropriate, but I would have like direct <laughs> conversations one-on-one -on -one with the door shut in which my feelings are crystal clear. Now, and I would tell them, look, I'm, I'm not gonna show you up in front of the team because I know you, you've got your pride and I respect that. And you're, and you're, we'll assume it's a male, you're a man and I respect that too. But by the same point, I'm a man and I've got a rule, you can't show me up either. So we can agree to disagree, we can have some conversations. If I can get, if this person's here and I can get him to here, I'm starting to win. And then what I usually would do with people like that, again, in my world, which is a little bit different than you, and they're in the middle of a deal, and it's screwed up because of their behavior, and I pull an all-nighter with them, and they win, they remember. And I've done that a bunch of times. I will do whatever I can to get them on without selling my own values out. But I, I never confront them in front, of, in front of a group. That's not my style anyways, but particularly with people like that, you're, you're, you're basically forcing them to respond back at you. One of the things on that that I, I think you're talking about, that guy getting 75% who uh, is helping you win, you know, the question for me is, is it sustainable long term? You know, is it, is it when we are playing in the semifinals of the conference tournament and it's win or go home, and it's, you know, it's tied with four minutes to go, is it sustainable to get us through that point? If you think it is, and there are plenty of coaches I know who value talent over values, then I think you've got to stick with it the whole way. You know, I've worked for coaches where we let some of the little stuff go, the short-term stuff go. You know, five minutes late for practice, that's all right, we got a game tomorrow. Let it go, let it go, let it go. February, things aren't going so well, and now all of a sudden we're pissed off because guys are showing up late. Like, that's who we are. We've already, we've already established that talent and performance is most important. So that's what's going to run 
the program and we're going to ride it out as long as we can. You know, my personal view is it's not sustainable long term. Agree. But if you feel that way, then I think you've got my, you know, I think you've got to, to go with it. You can't all of a sudden decide in February, well, wait a minute, I don't like the way we're doing things. We're going to let it go all year. You know, I mean, I've had conversations with players where I've had to deliver the message and they've literally looked at me and said, wait a minute, he's pissed off now? I mean, I've been doing this all year. You know, so I think that's something. If you're going to go down that road, you better expect it and accept it for the rest of the year. I'll give you a quick story from my football experience when I was coaching. Uh, running backs are the prima donnas of the football team, and, and, and they have a great game, and they walk around thinking that like they're God's gift to the game. And that's, that's a deal breaker for me, just because, you know, one, I was, not a, I was not a running back, I was a defensive back. What I would do, the mischievous sort that I can sometimes be, I would, if we were going to do a scrimmage session, I would work it out with the offensive line coach, and, the, and you got to have trust here for this, because trust me, these people know who these people are, and we would have it rigged up that on a given play, if, if, if I commented on the weather, on the next snap, the line wasn't going to block. I did this several times. Ball snap, quarterback turns, hands it off, bang, down he goes. The kid's getting up going, what is this? And I don't say a word, not a peep. Get in the huddle, and I call another play for that player. And he's breaking the huddle, looking at me going, I don't really know if I really want much to do with this. And I go, man, sure does look like rain. Same thing, ball snap, offensive line, never moves out of this stance, bang. Then I would tell an assistant coach, look, just get the next play. I'd pull the guy aside, and I would just, it was real simple. i go, you're not very good when the line doesn't block. And that, that would cure it. That would cure it. The simple notion that no one's bigger than the team. Was I running a risk? Of course. But you take risks. Final thoughts? I'll just wrap up with some uh, pearls. Like these are they're not necessarily related to change management, but when I'm up against it, when things are coming at me faster than I would like, if I need to ground myself, this is what I would go to for that type of grounding. The first one is hope is not a strategy. There's nothing wrong with being hopeful. There's nothing wrong with a glass half view of the world and being an optimist. But you can't build a business strategy. You can't build a coaching strategy. You can't build a game plan around, well, let's just see what happens and hope it all works out. Hope is not a strategy. Second one, see reality as it is and respond accordingly, even if it hurts. All these are easy to say, they're more difficult to work on. So see that reality, the story of that numbers. I gave you the example, people were telling me stuff, I hated what I was hearing. But it wasn't about what, what my feelings were, it was I needed to understand. So see reality as it is, and respond according to that reality, even if it isn't necessarily what you want to do. And lastly, make something happen. At Harvard they talk about no decision is you know, no decision is, by definition, a bad decision because it's an abdication of your leadership responsibility. So make something happen. And then the biggest challenge, and I'll close with a small bit of theater, and I, I was tickled when Bob alluded to this earlier, the biggest challenge is daring to be different. And a lot about daring to be different is about avoiding what I call the curse of preconceived notions. Now, the curse of preconceived notions is when, for example, you've done a change effort and you've come up with the what and the why and the how and something's keeping you from pulling the trigger on it. You hold back. You've got a good idea and you don't act upon it. It can also manifest itself when you conclude that a situation, a player, a scheme, is not what it needs to be, but unfortunately, it is what it is and is all that it'll ever be. And when you fall cursed to the preconceived notions, you deny yourself the potential that exists if you are willing to look at things differently. My case in point, if I say to you, what's this? You're all gonna say, well, that's a cup. And you would be absolutely 100% correct. But if we look at this cup differently, 
Okay. This cup can also be a pen holder. This cup, if we put it upside down on a desk, can be a miniature pedestal. This cup, if we lay it on its side on the floor, it can be a practice putting hole for golf. This cup is so much more than a cup if we look at it differently and see its possibilities. And the same holds true for you, your staff, your players, and your program. Don't deny yourselves your potential by not seeing the possibilities and potential that exist within yourself, your players, your program. Dare to be different, avoid the curse of preconceived notions, and realize your potential. Thank you so much for your time today. change that the tendency is to get too complicated to overdo it yeah to, because what it made me think of from a coaching perspective is you know the first thing that, that stuck in my head is ball screen how many different ways did your program defend the ball screen because I've been around programs where that number is like 10 12 you know different ways you know blue ice side up down gold, red, um, and I just think that's, you know, as coaches we always say, you know, keep it simple, that's what we're trying to do, but I'm not sure that's what we always do, you know, if it's, a, if it's under 10 on the shot clock and it's a middle ball screen and the five man is setting it, here's how we're playing, you know, and I just think, you know, it, it, no, no, it, it's interesting to hear you say that from a business perspective because we tend to, our solution is to do more, our solution is to come up with a new way, you know, well, we're playing this team and they can really do this, so when it's on the side, we're gonna ice it. And I think it, you know, I, I think it breeds confusion, so I found it interesting that you brought that point. No, up. I mean, people, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, people have a tendency, they kind of go, in the business world, like somehow we're like a higher order of being? Well, no, we're not. I mean, we, we, it's people with the same stuff going on that, that you guys have. Well, I mean, that, that whole one ten thousandth of a percent. We just went down this path, you went down this path. But the reality is the same. So, yeah, I would encounter that everywhere. And then if you then lump me in with responsibility for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and you factor in cultural differences and business differences and everything that goes along with that, yeah, it gets, it gets, very, it gets very complicated. And you know, again, I'll go back to Jack Welch talked about the key to business success is three things. Speed, simplicity, and self-confidence. Speed, like particularly in this day, who wants to be slow at anything? Who, you know, you can't be slow. Okay, if you're gonna be fast, you've gotta keep it simple, which goes to the question of Bob race. And if we're doing multiple processes uh, dealing with the same thing, if everybody's seen the movie Office Space, in the TPS reports, boom, business. Like the scary part about that movie was it resonated way too much. <laughs> but one of my, one of my, I used to say this, like within the sphere, I'm, I'm, I'm not holier than now, but I used to say within the sphere of where I operated, I did not want Dilbert to be funny. I wanted us to just de-Dilbertize how we were behaving with one another. And everybody got it. So yeah, they, they, they have a tendency to, so speed, simplicity, and if you're gonna keep it simple, because most people think, ooh, in order for me to be secure, what I do must be complicated. Okay, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be fast, you gotta keep it simple, if you're gonna keep it simple, you gotta have self-confidence to do it that way. So I've always considered it a badge of honor that people kind of go, hey, Phil, I hear what you're saying, this doesn't seem that complicated. Thank you. I'm sorry, No, no, please. No, go ahead. Um, Back to you when you were talking about making change happen and you said about doing your homework, quantitative and qualitative, so you put it in coach terms and you said, you know, the obvious quantitative is looking at stats and seeing part of the story there. Could you give an example of, in coach terms, like, what's the qualitative part of that homework? Yeah, qualitative part of the homework would be, like, you know, one-on-ones with players 
And if you're kind of like looking at the team's performance and say you have, because you're a coach, you have an intuitive sense that, okay, the, defensively we weren't very, very good. And you kind of, you know, you do all your uh, statistical analysis. It would be, uh, what I did is I came up with, with 10 very simple, non-academic questions that I asked a broad cross-section of people. So it would be just literally you saying, okay, defense, and coming up with a very, not a questionnaire, a simple sort of set of questions and have a conversation, not an interview, a conversation with a player and ask that player and everybody else the same questions and then just listen to what they tell you. It's no more, trust me, it's no, if I, I don't have the 10 questions, but if I threw them up on the screen, you'd be underwhelmed. Because the point being, there's nothing high tech or fancy about it. You know, what, you didn't need to go to Harvard Business School to come up with the list of 10 questions. But the, they were broad, open-ended, you know, probably the coaching, open-ended questions about the area you're trying to explore. And they give them a, give them a sense of a background. You just say, look, I, I'm concerned about the defense. It looks like the numbers seem to suggest this. But look, I'm coaching it, but you're playing it. All right, let's have a conversation. What's, what's it like for you doing what we're doing? <coughs> And if you've got any kind of relationship in this trust, their players want to win. You ain't roll out of bed, they want to win. They want to be good. And they know that you want to win, that your livelihood's at stake here. So yeah, they'll, if, particularly if it's one-on-one. -on -one. I love one-on-one. -on -one. Door shuts, you can't hide. And people, if there's trust, it's unbelievable what they'll tell you. One other interesting point that you brought up which I think resonated with me is, is celebrating every time they do something right, you know, especially when it comes to change. And you started it by saying, I don't think coaches have a problem with this. That's an intuitive, perhaps erroneous guess. And I would disagree. I mean, I think as coaches, we tend to overlook the positive too much. You know, you, you sort of accept it. You know, the, the guy that does everything right that you can really count on doesn't get a lot of your attention, you know? Um, so I just think it's interesting to think about that you thought that way, but I find myself not spending a lot of time with the guys I know I can count on, you know, because I'm just used to them doing things right, and, and you don't necessarily celebrate the well, thing with, with, with praise, too, I was in a meeting, and I had a, a, a boss droning on with 15 minutes of just negative statistics, and it's just like, I finally, I just kind of went, okay, there's a bunch of us, and I'm just saying, look, are we doing anything right? I'm not disputing what you're saying. Are we doing anything right? You know, well, and then we came up with some stuff, and I said, I said, okay, and everything in business is like, well, year, year to date versus plan, year to date versus budget. So I said, where are we year to date versus plan regarding praise? And everybody was like doing a twitch because we've 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 done we had some problems, but we've done a half dozen things pretty good. And yeah, we're resource constrained, we're financially constrained. There's all these constraints. But there's no budget for praise. It's 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 inexpensive, and it makes such a difference. So if you think you're not praising enough, you might want to revisit that. And I, apologies on my part for assuming, which is always a big mistake, sir. Um, just with that level of praise, can you possibly give the coach praise too much? Uh, like for instance, you don't want to get to the point where you're saying that's a great layup. Um, right. You, think that, you, don't want, you don't want, like, you know, someone takes a charge. That, that's a great defensive play. You're, you're excited about that. But you don't want to get to the point where you're praising them for kind of a shoe. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's what I think it, it almost becomes sarcastic. Right. But when, they, when people are doing stuff that makes a difference, find the time to, to notice it. But yeah, you, you, you know, the gratuitous praise basically waters down the legit praise that's out there. You, you, your point's fair. And, and I'm thinking about, you know, Ryan Gomes, for example, you know, was an All-American. Like, we took it for granted when he got 20 and 10. Like, that's what he did. You know, there's, I mean, Tariq Carter this year for us was an All-American. Great leader, you know, great in practice every day. Like, we just got used to it. Some of the time I had to grab him and say, you know, Tariq, I appreciate the approach you bring to practice every day. You know, as opposed to, you know, it's not as simple as, like, hey, you made your layups and warm-ups or something like that, but sort of just recognizing the positive that you tend to, to take for granted. When he went and got 25 and 10 against Georgetown, it helped us win, you know, and, and, but we just kind of accepted it. Like, we would be more 
you know, praiseworthy of the kid who didn't play much who got six and four, you know, and we sort of overlook, you know. Well, I think what you're saying, again, is like almost like a Tim Duncan effect. For years, Tim Duncan was a double double machine. And maybe we didn't appreciate the fact, like this is what, what he's doing on a regular basis. So as a coach, do you, you recommend that, I don't know, you kind of maybe take those guys aside of when you have your team meetings, you know, and you, you kind of say, you know, tonight's game was such and such, but, you know, this guy really, you know, we've come accustomed to him doing this, maybe we don't say it enough. Because maybe that player kind of feels left out, maybe he's working his behind off, and he never really gets mentioned. Yeah, I spend more time in practice. I mean, I write stuff on my practice plan, and, and there's like four or five sets of initials of guys that I need to talk to, and I find it's almost always negative. You know, so I'm writing DM, Donnie McGrath. I got to talk to him about his sit test, you know. Uh, you know, Tariq Carter, I'm, you know, like he was late for this or whatever. And I just think we spend, so that's what I spend 10 minutes before practice about is the negative stuff, you know. And, and the guy who went from not playing a lot of minutes to playing eight minutes and giving us two rebounds, maybe I'll go praise him. But our best defender who locked up, you know, the leading scorer on the other team, again, you know, I probably am not going to say anything to him, you know, so it's that kind of thing, just kind of finding that balance, like, you know, appreciating the positive as opposed to taking it for granted. I think Tim, Tim Duncan is a perfect example. Or just kind of like similar to the like, coaches who work on the weaknesses a lot and you know, on the team instead of focusing on their strengths. So. Right. I think it's natural. That's what you do. You plan on going into practice. You're not, you know, worried about the guys that are doing things right, you know? Do you find any issues with, with praising despite a negative outcome? Like Coach and I talk a lot about how we coach turnovers and specifically, um, you know, I've always been a big fan of telling a kid when he throws a turnover, that's a great turnover. Like he's throwing an outlet pass and it's too high, can't reach it. And I, I like to tell kids, hey, that, that's a great turnover. I want you to throw that pass every single time. Do you think there's any, any correlation with that? Is there ever a time where that's a bad issue? That to me is smart coaching. You know, if, if, you know, in business, what I would sometimes do is, it, my business was very similar to yours. I mean, there's, there's, there's projects that involve competitors that have to do perform, and there's a winner, and there's strategy and tactics and teams. It's very much the same. And I had situations where you get the dweebs in the suits that sit there, well, we lost, and it's like, let's punish the team. And my attitude was, you know, I would frequently, on those moments, that's when I take the team. I, we got the word, we didn't get it. And I knew that we did, that, that our process, I completely agree with Bob, it's about process. The process was spot on. We did everything right except get the result. And they, that, at that point, the team, they feel miserable. And I would take them out. And I would thank them for the effort. And I say, look, look let's, let's vent our spleen over a couple of pints in the pub. And when you go home to your families, I want a big smile on your face and I want you to be a good husband and father. So yeah, just because they lost doesn't mean they stink. That's how we coach turnovers. We take them out drinking. <laughs> 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 All right, I want to uh, just a, a two minute stretch real quick. We'll do some more water upstairs. We want to grab a quick drink. We're uh, just a little behind. We're going to get started with the next segment, you know, maybe half the time.